All right, let's talk about the elephant in the room, or should we say bear in the room? It's Russia, obviously. And we've got to do this because we can't realistically continue to make videos about the aerospace industry and space exploration and colonization of planets and moons and all of that cool stuff without acknowledging the major role that the Russian space program has to play in all of this. Or the role that they were supposed to play before this baffling display of aggression against Ukraine that has united the vast majority of Western civilization in defiance of Putin. It's becoming impossible to think that the spirit of international cooperation between America, Europe, Japan, and Russia that defined the field of space exploration for the past 20 years could possibly go on after this conflict. And this is going to throw a very big wrench into the entire aerospace industry, because the Russians and their rockets and their engines have really been the workhorse that has kept the space launches flowing. And of course, new players definitely have been stepping up in big ways, but even still, if we take Russia and Ukraine for that matter out of the aerospace equation, we are left with a big hole that needs to be filled in a very short time. So let's try and figure out what the effect of this madness is going to be in the short term, and then we're going to have to talk about what this changes for the industry going forward. This is not a fun video, but it is an important one. This is the space race. Let's start off with a few stories from the recent news that show the effect this has already started to have. On March 2nd, we saw this absolutely bizarre tweet from the official Roscosmos account that basically announced they were holding an Arian space launch vehicle hostage with three dozen OneWeb satellites inside. The Soyuz rocket is currently on the pad at the Russian-controlled Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, where it was scheduled to launch on March 5th. It seems that Roscosmos Director General Dmitry Rogozin has decided the launch would proceed only if the UK-based company OneWeb met new conditions. These include a guarantee its satellites would not be used for military purposes, and that the British government divest its stakes in the company. The British government spent $500 million in 2020 to invest in the company that is creating a satellite internet constellation similar to SpaceX's Starlink. The Russians say that the rocket will be removed from the pad unless these demands are met. While the UK officials have already said they are not selling their share, and OneWeb has ordered their staff to abandon the payload and leave the Cosmodrome. So that's pretty weird, right? It's our first unmistakable sign that business as usual has come to an end. This is a big, big problem for Arian Space right now. Not only because their launch seems to almost certainly be cancelled, but we're left wondering if they will even get that rocket back, or what happens to the 36 OneWeb satellites inside. Kinda seems like the Russians are pulling finders keepers here. They've already been seen removing the international flags from the body of the rocket, they're trying really hard to make a point here, but I honestly don't know what it is supposed to be other than that they're a bunch of assholes. We can also assume that France-based Arian Space will not be receiving access to any further Russian-made Soyuz rockets, which they rely on as their medium-lift vehicle, the bread and butter of their business. The company still has their own Arian 5 rocket that is powered by European-made Vulcan engines, which is good, but Arian 5 is a heavy lift rocket that wouldn't be economical for those OneWeb launches, so that's already a mess. Next, we can talk about the fate of NASA astronaut Mark Van Hei, who is currently on the International Space Station and is scheduled to come home in a Russian Soyuz capsule. Since the end of the space shuttle program in 2011, the Soyuz has been NASA's de facto link to the ISS. Of course, in 2020, that started to change with the first crewed flight of the SpaceX Dragon, but clearly, NASA was still counting on the Russian capsule to get their man home. As far as we know, Russia hasn't refused to mark his seat in the capsule, but if it does go through, it's going to be a pretty awkward ride. Luckily, the capsule should land on ground in rural Kazakhstan so the NASA astronaut can make a quick exit to safety. Either way, this will likely be the last time that NASA astronauts fly on a Russian vehicle, which is marking the end of an era. Like we said, there is SpaceX and their Dragon capsule that has proven to be a reliable new method for getting astronauts into orbit, so that should be able to meet the need for American astronauts going forward. 
NASA has already announced that they are purchasing three additional Crew Dragon flights from SpaceX on top of their existing contract, but still, SpaceX can't be everything to everyone. NASA was supposed to have two viable options for getting people into space by now, but as we know, Boeing has so far screwed up so badly with their Starliner capsule that it can't even manage to get into the air for a test launch, let alone be judged safe for human flight. Not only is that an embarrassment to the company who made it, the failure is now leaving NASA vulnerable and under-equipped. The timing could not be worse. But people aren't the only payload that we deliver to the ISS. We also need to send cargo. Right now, that is handled by the Cygnus spacecraft. It's a purpose-built cargo hauler for NASA's commercial resupply service. The Cygnus launches to orbit on the Antares rocket made by Northrop Grumman, and even though Grumman is an American company, the first stage of the Antares is actually manufactured in Ukraine, and it is powered by Russian engines. From what we've heard, the company does not have a significant amount of hardware in stock and will run out of boosters pretty fast, so that's yet another problem. The United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket also relies on Russian-made engines for its first stage booster. But luckily, the company has already confirmed that they have enough engines in stock in the United States for another two dozen launches. After that, Atlas V is slated to be replaced with the new Vulcan Centaur, which is supposed to be powered by Blue Origin's BE-4 engine. Obviously, that's an American product, which is good. On the flip side though, Blue Origin is outrageously behind schedule on the development of this engine and have yet to produce a fully functioning prototype, which is bad. So, if Blue Balls can't follow through on building an engine and ULA can't get their hands on any more Russian hardware to stretch the life of the Atlas, well, then that would be yet another problem for our collection. Obviously, there is then the International Space Station itself to talk about. A large chunk of it belongs to Russia, the rest is shared by NASA and international partners. Not only does that make for an awkward living situation, it also threatens the future of operations of the station. You've probably seen that Roscosmos chief Dmitry Rogozin has been making some unhinged Twitter posts about the ISS deorbiting and landing on people's heads if Russia decides to pull their modules from the station. So the deal is, the NASA sections of the ISS provide power and life support, while the Russian section provides the propulsion. The ISS orbits at a relatively low height, around 400 kilometers, so the 500 ton structure is subject to atmospheric drag that will slowly pull it down towards the Earth. So without the Russian boosters, the ISS absolutely would come crashing back down to Earth. That wouldn't happen anytime soon, it would probably take around 5 years to actually hit the re-entry point, but still, not good. Elon Musk has offered SpaceX to take over that responsibility for reboosting the station if the need does arise, and the Draco thrusters on the Dragon capsule could probably do that job, but NASA doesn't seem convinced. NASA insider Brian Whedon told Politico in an interview, we'd have to invest a bunch of additional money to make that happen. The ISS was never intended to be broken apart. It's fair to say that NASA might not be interested in trying to save the station. In reality, it was supposed to have been retired by now anyway, but its life has been extended out to 2030 to give private companies more time to manufacture their own orbital platforms. So that's going to be a problem, and it's going to be a messy one, but it's impossible to imagine that business as usual can continue on up there. As we are writing this, the violence and cruelty being inflicted on the Ukrainian people just continues to escalate, and it's all so pointless. So this is not going to be anything we just forgive and forget. This is a permanent breakdown in the international relationship. And we could go on and on about the Russian-involved projects that are now seemingly put to ruin. There is ExoMars, a joint venture between the European and Russian space agencies. They were supposed to launch the Rosalind Franklin rover mission next year, which is designed specifically to search for signs of past life on the planet Mars. Can't imagine that will be happening anymore, which obviously sucks because finding alien fossils on Mars would be kind of a big deal. We could look at South Korea, who were relying on the Russian Soyuz for two key satellite launches this year. The Koreans are trying to build up their CompSat network of synthetic aperture radar. 
That's basically a way for the country to do high resolution radar imaging for purposes like ocean and land management, disaster monitoring, and environment monitoring. Korea Aerospace Research Institute spokesman Ro Hyung Il said in a recent interview, if Russia is excluded from options available, it's a big problem. See, this guy knows. Problems are the theme of the day here. So taking a look around, our supply of available rockets is going to take a hit, but it might not be a fatal blow. It would be much worse if ULA had managed to stockpile a year's worth of engines for the Atlas. But that still leaves us with incredibly limited use of the Antares. That rocket is as good as dead right now. Cygnus can probably be transitioned to launch on Falcon 9, hopefully, if there are flights available. Like we said before, SpaceX can't swoop in and just fix everything overnight. Rocket launches are planned out years in advance. They don't pivot on a dime. So we obviously lose the Soyuz as a launch option. The Russians have already said that they have suspended all Soyuz launches from Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. That is an incredibly versatile medium lift, and it's going to leave multiple holes in the international launch calendar. We also lose the Russian Proton-M heavy lift rocket as well. This one is not as heavily relied upon by non-Russian agencies, and to be honest, it actually fails to deploy the upper stage pretty regularly, so that's not terrible, and we're pretty set for heavy lift rockets between Ariane 5, Falcon Heavy, and Delta IV Heavy. We do have a bit of a problem coming up in the near future, and that unfortunately hinges on Blue Origin, which we don't love. Their BE-4 engine is supposed to power ULA's new Vulcan rocket and Blue Origin's own New Glenn as well. Vulcan was critically important before the Russian aggression. It's even more vital now. Vulcan Centaur is supposed to replace the Atlas V next year, and we know that extending Atlas V past its current lifespan will be nearly impossible because they will run out of engines. There is already a lot riding on this rocket. The US military is counting on Vulcan to lift about 60% of their national security payloads into space from 2022 to 2027. And as much as I despise Jeff Bezos and pretty much everything that he's involved in, the new Glenn would be a really nice rocket to have available as well. It's a fully reusable first stage with heavy lift capability and a very large cargo fairing. But new Glenn also needs that BE-4 engine. This engine was supposed to be in service two years ago. They started testing back in 2017, but have yet to deliver a launch ready candidate. Of course, we do have some promising developments on the new horizon. The Rocket Lab Neutron and its fully reusable first stage and 15 ton cargo capacity is looking like a prime candidate for the world's new favorite medium lift rocket. And given the company's exceptional success rate so far, there's no reason to believe that they can't follow through with a great product. That's slated for 2023. Then obviously, there's the SpaceX Starship. If this thing actually works out as well as Elon Musk is promising, then I don't know, maybe SpaceX actually can be all things to all people, because the advertised capability of Starship is absolutely unprecedented, and the idea that each ship could launch as many as three times in one day, that could basically support an entire space program with one rocket. So we are very optimistic about Starship, but appreciate that it's going to be a preposterously difficult project to get right. So that's honestly just a sampling of all the problems that Russia has created for the global aerospace industry. We could go on and on. And of course, all of this space stuff is insignificant compared to the suffering of the people on the ground in Ukraine who are dying, losing their homes and being forced to stand and fight against an invasion that doesn't even make any sense. It's all just horrible. But anyways, as always, comments down below. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.